Okay, so thank you so much, Julian, for that introduction. And thank you to the Institute of Alcohol Studies, first for funding this research, but also for organising and hosting the event today. Um, so as Julian mentioned, I'm a research fellow at the University of Hull, um, and I was formerly a research fellow at the University of Kent, where I was awarded this grant. Um, so my team are based in Kent, and that's Miles Godfrey and Professor Lindsay Forbes, who hopefully are on the call today. And we're, um, we've conducted a systematic review looking at alcohol brief interventions for older adults with cognitive decline. So you've heard a bit about the plan for the next hour. I'm going to talk through the systematic review and then I'm going to talk a bit about next steps. And that's where I'm really keen to hear from you about your top three priorities for research in alcohol and cognition. Um, we're then going to have an opportunity for questions and discussion. So why were we interested in alcohol and older adults with cognitive decline? Well, first of all, we know that there's a high prevalence of at-risk drinking in adults aged over 55. So 36% of men aged 55 to 74 are drinking above low risk levels. And by low risk levels, we're talking about over 14 units a week, which is the current uh, low risk guideline in the UK. And then 22% of women aged 55 to 64 and 17% of women aged 65 to 74 are also drinking above low risk levels. So that's quite a high proportion of people in those age groups. We also know that we have an aging population here in the UK. So in 2019, 19% of the population were aged 65 or above. And by 2043, that's forecast to be 24% of the population. So we've got a large number of people in older age groups and there's a high proportion of them that are drinking at risky levels. So why should we be concerned about that? Well, we already know that alcohol consumption is linked to over 200 disease and injury conditions, but older adults are particularly vulnerable to some additional risks from at-risk drinking. So older adults who are at-risk drinkers are more likely to experience cognitive decline, higher levels of frailty, um, are at higher risk of falls, harm owing to interactions between medication and alcohol, and they're also more vulnerable to acute risk due to higher blood concentration of alcohol at lower levels of consumption. And this is down to um, a change in body composition and metabolism as we age. So what about cognitive impairment? Why are we interested in this group? Well, again, it's really around the prevalence and the numbers. So in adults aged over 60 um, or 60 plus, sorry, around six to 12% of this age group experience mild cognitive impairment. And by that, we mean experiencing some kind of problems with thinking and cognition that can be objectively measured in screening tests, but are not necessarily causing um, significant functional kind of problems with day-to-day -day living. Of adults aged 60 plus who don't have a diagnosis of dementia or mild cognitive impairment, um, around 20, 25% are thought to experience subjective cognitive decline. So this is where people are experiencing problems with cognition that can't necessarily be objectively measured. So you'll notice that I haven't mentioned here kind of dementia or alcohol related brain damage. Now it's not because these aren't important, um, on the contrary. But we were really interested in brief interventions, and it might be that people at the more severe end of cognitive impairment or this more severe end of um, alcohol use disorder need a slightly different type of intervention. And when I come and talk at the end about next steps, we'll be thinking about those groups then. So we've got a high number of older adults in the UK. We've got a high prevalence of at-risk drinking in older adults, and we've got a high prevalence of cognitive decline in these, this age group. In addition to that, we know that alcohol is linked to cognitive decline as well. So there's a lot of interactions going on here, and that's why we're interested in this area. So how many people in the UK are, who are living with MCI or subjective cognitive decline are at-risk drinkers? The short answer is we don't know. So anyone that works in the alcohol field that will know that alcohol recording in clinical services is um, variable at best. So it's really hard to get a number for this. In preparing for this grant application, myself and um, Professor Forbes calculated a sort of very rough estimate. And this is based on the population demographics in the UK and the prevalence rates that I've presented here today. And we calculated that there are potentially 690,000 people in the UK with mild cognitive impairment or subjective cognitive decline who are at an additional preventable risk due to alcohol consumption. Again, I um, want to reiterate that was a very rough calculation, but you can see how we calculated it on Open Science Framework if you're interested. Okay, 
So what interventions do we have? We know there's a lot of people that might be affected by drinking at high risk levels who have um, some level of cognitive decline, but what interventions can we have or are there out there? So the World Health Organization has identified alcohol as a key modifiable risk factor in the development of dementia, and they recommend interventions to reduce drinking in older adults with and without mild cognitive decline. In addition, we know that NICE recommends screening and brief interventions in a range of health and social care settings, so it might be that screening and brief intervention are appropriate for this population. Just to touch on alcohol brief interventions, so these tend to be time limited interventions and they tend to be delivered outside of specialist settings, so outside of specialist alcohol treatment. And they tend to follow this frame structure. So it starts with feedback on current drinking and harms, and that's usually done by using a validated screening tool. And then the intervention will follow these six stages. However, if we think about these kinds of interventions, we think about people with cognitive cognitive decline, it's likely that people with cognitive decline will require some modifications to this type of intervention in order to fully benefit. So that's what we were interested in. We wanted to know what is the evidence base for alcohol brief interventions that have been modified to meet the needs of people with cognitive decline. What did we do? Well, we conducted a systematic review. So for people not familiar with systematic reviews, they sit right at the top of the kind of evidence pyramid. Uh, so they are a kind of gold standard in terms of evidence. Um, and this is because they look at multiple trials or multiple studies to assess the overall impact of interventions or kind of other areas. So they're a type of evidence review, but they're conducted with the equivalent rigor to primary research. And the aim of the way in which they're conducted and the way in which they're reported is that they are transparent, replicable and updatable. So that's what we really wanted to do here. We wanted to find all of the evidence in this area and do it in a transparent, replicable and updatable way so that it's kind of relevant going forward. So our review had two questions. Firstly, what is the content of alcohol brief interventions modified for people with cognitive decline? And secondly, how effective are alcohol brief interventions modified for people with cognitive decline in reducing alcohol consumption amongst older adult drinkers experiencing cognitive decline? I obviously wrote that question without thinking I was going to have to read it out loud because it's very long. But essentially, we wanted to know what's the content of these modified interventions and how effective are they? So in the systematic review, we were looking for studies that involved specific types of participants and interventions. So our initial review aimed to look at studies that involved adults aged 50 and above who drink above low risk levels and experience any type of cognitive decline. As you are soon to find out, uh, there was a real lack of evidence in this area. So in order to find enough kind of information to put this review together, but also to find information that might be relevant for future intervention development, we extended our, ex well, our inclusion criteria slightly, um, and I'll talk about that in my results section. So for the interventions, we were initially looking just at alcohol screening and or brief interventions with any modifications for people experiencing any type of cognitive decline. And we ended up extending that out to other types of kind of alcohol intervention, not necessarily brief interventions, because there was some learning that we could take that take to uh, look at interventions going forward. In terms of comparators, we were looking at any or no comparator and we were looking for any outcome. We prospectively registered our um, systematic review on Prospero, so you can see um, our plans online uh, if you are interested in that. Okay, so on to what we found. Here is our sort of obligatory PRISMA diagram. Uh, this is just to show how many studies we found and how we kind of um, got them down to the number that we included. So from our searches, we identified 10,526 studies and we looked at the titles. So this is myself, Miles and Lindsay looked at the titles and the abstracts to get this down to 328 that we wanted to read the full text of. So we read all 328 papers and we ended up getting down to just nine papers, which covered eight studies. So one, two papers were looking at the same study. Uh, the majority of the ones that were excluded at the point of full text were because we included a lot of papers that were looking at 
alcohol brief interventions for older adults in the hope that they would mention cognition or maybe have a sub-analysis for cognition um, in the paper. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case um, in nearly all of them, really. Um, we also identified two studies that were ongoing, uh, so they look like they may be relevant to the study to the um, review, but they haven't published their results yet. So what did we find? Uh, kind of in essence, we found that there were no studies that looked at the effectiveness of modifications to brief interventions for people with cognitive decline. However, we did find descriptions of modifications from different settings and different types of intervention that could be relevant to screening and brief intervention. We found some evidence of feasibility and acceptability of screening and brief intervention in memory assessment services. And we found some evidence that people with cognitive impairments don't do worse with computer-based interventions. And I'm gonna talk in more depth about what we found uh, next. So this slide, and I apologize that it's a bit busy, but essentially what we did is across the nine papers, we took out all of the modifications that were mentioned and described, and then we mapped them in this kind of conceptual map to look at how they were related to each other. And the aim of this was to try and look at kind of groupings for our papers that would allow us to make sense of the papers and to report them. So this was all part of our analysis. From this mapping exercise, we came up with four areas. So screening tools, screening and brief intervention with a memory component, intervention modifications, but not brief interventions, um, and then computer-based interventions. And I'm gonna talk through each of those in a bit more depth next. So first of all, we had alcohol screening for people with cognitive decline. We found three papers that were looking at this area. So first of all, we had Randall James and colleagues. They were looking at the feasibility and acceptability of screening for alcohol use in memory assessment services, and they conducted a qualitative study with 10 service users from memory assessment services. They administered these three screening tools, which are all validated screening tools for alcohol, but they added some kind of modifications to meet the need of this population. So they provided drink diaries and measuring cups a week before the assessment to help with recall. And then they developed kind of, well, they used interpersonal skills to develop a relationship with the person that they were conducting the assessment with. And they had more of an interactive process in terms of the screening. So they had some repeating confirmatory statements, follow up questions, which you wouldn't normally see with screening tools um, to ensure that both the assessor and the person being assessed were kind of on the same page. And also where appropriate, they involved carers. And they concluded that it was feasible and acceptable to deliver screening in memory assessment services. The second paper was by Fake and colleagues. And these um, researchers are in the same group as Randall James and colleagues. And they also were looking at feasibility and acceptability, but from the perspective of memory assessment service providers. Um, they also concluded that it was feasible and acceptable. They identified some specific barriers and actually some of the barriers that the professionals identified, which were around um, how cognitive impairments might impact people's ability to recall their alcohol consumption and may lead to underreporting. These were kind of addressed through the modifications that Randall James made. And there were other barriers that they identified and some suggestions for changes. So both of these papers concluded that it was acceptable and feasible, um, but neither of them were really testing the modifications because that wasn't the aim of those studies. The third study in this area was Philpot and colleagues, um, and they looked at the validity of the CAGE and AUDIT, uh, which are both screening tools, in identifying alcohol problems in older adult community mental health service users. So this sample wasn't exclusively people with cognitive impairments, but over 50% did have a diagnosis of dementia. So a large proportion of the sample were um, who we were kind of looking for. They concluded that the audit, and they used a brief audit, the audit five, they concluded that these were better than the cage for identifying alcohol problems in this population. Um, it should be noted that it was a fairly small sample size and only 20 of the people were identified through kind of gold standard as having alcohol problems. Um, so um, there may be some issues with the power of that study, but it might be that the audit is more appropriate. And I think people who are used using these tools might agree that that's the case. So moving on to the next group of studies, we had uh, studies looking at screening and brief interventions with a memory component. So we had two 
papers here, but they were both looking at the same study. They were by Etna and colleagues and Juru and colleagues. Now, these um, papers were looking at an intervention that included um, a screening tool being delivered, and then they offered a personalized report and had some calls with a health educator. Now, the reason that we included them is that the screening tool they used was the comorbidity alcohol risk evaluation tool, which is shown here, well, part of which is shown here, sorry. And you can see that they do mention memory problems just down there in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and the way that the tool works is if people have certain comorbidities, then the amount of alcohol they consume that makes them kind of at risk is different according to their comorbidities. So essentially, if you have memory problems, the amount of alcohol you drink that makes you considered at risk is different than if you don't have memory problems. Um, but you can see that it really is just a kind of passing mention. However, if people identified that they did have memory problems and were drinking at risky levels, they were provided with a forgetfulness tip sheet. Um, so there was some information in this intervention linking kind of cognition and alcohol consumption. That said, they weren't looking at, at, for, at an intervention for people with cognitive impairments. So they didn't measure cognitive impairment in the sample. So we can't really draw any conclusions about how effective this is or isn't for our population of interest. So the third group of papers were looking at modifications to alcohol interventions, um, and this is kind of specialist services. And these probably had the most um, information in terms of modifications that might be useful um, for brief interventions, even though they weren't looking at brief interventions themselves. So Collings et al were looking at a residential rehabilitation setting for adults aged 18 and above with drug and or alcohol problems. And Seddon and colleagues were looking at a community alcohol treatment service that was specifically for people aged 50 and above, so an age specific service. Both settings were modified to meet the needs of people with cognitive impairments, but they weren't exclusively for people with cognitive impairments. So the modifications that they had in common were having a person centered approach, so going at the speed and with the goals of the individual, having screening and assessment for cognitive function. They had a focus on staff training around cognition and substance use, and they explicitly discussed the link between alcohol and cognition with service users. They provided simplified written materials, written notes on treatment sessions, and they provided information in multiple formats. They had flexibility in terms of session length. Um, they set small goals and they focused on just one area kind of per treatment session and they had easy ways to identify staff, and they also used a range of methods as prompts and reminders for people. In addition to those um, modifications they had in common, Collings et al had the inclusion of family into goal setting, they had morning treatment sessions, they talked about practicing skills before concepts, they had a kind of universal design in terms of the setting and materials so that everything was accessible to people with and without cognitive problems, they um, incorporated repetition into their treatment sessions. They provided detailed sets with um, practice sessions and they had progress kind of based on individual knowledge skills and mastery rather than just at set time points, which goes back to the person-centered care. Seddon and colleagues looked at an outreach model. So they were looking at alcohol treatment services, but rather than having patients have to come into the service, they went out to see them in their homes and communities. And we know that going into a service is sometimes a problem for people with cognitive impairments. So both of these studies were observational in nature and they were set up to evaluate these new services. So there are some really interesting um, points here around modifications, um, but they weren't evaluating these modifications in terms of treatment outcomes because that wasn't really what they were set up um, to look at. So the final group of studies were computer-based alcohol interventions. Um, so both of these studies were secondary analyses of random, randomized controlled trial data. So there were two trials looking at these computer-based interventions, and they were looking at whether the interventions uh, were good in terms of treatment retention and treatment outcome. So they found uh, moderately positive results. And then these papers looked at whether people with cognitive impairments did better or worse with these specific interventions. So both sets of authors suggested that computer-based therapy might be appropriate for people with cognitive impairments because it can go at a flexible pace according to the needs of the individual rather than in a group work where you have to go at the pace of the group. And 
There is the ability within computer related uh, interventions to repeat tasks as many times as is necessary. In addition, Shulman and colleagues thought that their program was specifically good for people with cognitive impairments because it was set up to promote the retention of material. They had some experiential learning through modeling of actions with actors and they required mastery to progress. So similar to what Collins said, you can't just go through each phase by kind of clicking on and clicking on. You need to master each level before you move on. In terms of what they found, both papers found that there was no significant difference in terms of treatment outcomes or treatment retention for people with cognitive impairments. And so they concluded that these might be appropriate, um, so computer-based interventions might be appropriate for people with cognitive impairments, because you might expect people with cognitive impairments to do worse in terms of treatment outcomes um, generally, but that wasn't the case here. Okay, so that's basically what we found. Um, so in terms of what does it mean and what can we do next? Well, what have we learned? So despite expanding the inclusion criteria and despite there obviously being a real interest in this area as demonstrated by having you all here, thank you. Um, there were very few studies in this area. Some of the studies were small in scope. So we wanted to include any kind of uh, any study design but of course, the um, generalization, generalizability sorry, of the findings is limited with the smaller studies. And although some studies described modifications, none of them were set up to test the effectiveness of these modifications in reducing alcohol consumption in at-risk drinkers with cognitive decline. So we weren't really able to get any evidence on efficacy in terms of our second review question. That said, they did describe some modifications. And if we're thinking about intervention development going forward, some of the modifications we might want to consider are modifications to screening. So having tools to aid re recall, such as drinking diaries and measuring cups and information from others. Um, having perhaps an interactive delivery of the screening tool. So rather than reading the questions by rote. Um, then there's the potential that we could use screening that takes comorbidities into the account and the potential that the audit might be better than the cage. There's also something around staff knowledge and understanding, helping staff to understand safe limits and how best to advise their patients, and also providing explicit information on the link between alcohol and cognition. And this seems like it might be particularly important when people are accessing care because they're concerned about their cognition. Other modifications that we might want to think about are the kind of more pragmatic ones. So providing simplified multi-format materials, having rec written records of um, sessions, incorporating repetition into the intervention, having more detailed plans and steps for people to achieve goals and having kind of one goal at a time and having a bit more flexibility and mastery than perhaps is usually found in um, brief interventions. There's also something around kind of prompts and reminders on how we identify staff. And just to kind of consider as well, having more of an outreach approach potentially and considering kind of computer-based programs as well. So what next? Well, um, we've seen that there's basically very little evidence in this area, as I've said. Um, so the next step, sensible step, seems to be to think about developing an intervention that will meet the needs of this group. Now, we've got some uh, modifications that we might want to test um, that we've just that I've just discussed. But because we've got no evidence of their effectiveness from the evidence to date, it might be a good idea to have a, more of a consensus approach where you bring in kind of key professionals and people with lived experience to think about what that intervention should look like. And of course, the next key step is doing robust evaluations of effectiveness and cost effectiveness of any intervention. So we know that levels of cognitive decline and alcohol problems are on a spectrum, and it's likely that people with different levels of severity might need different types of intervention. Um, equally, people with different levels of severity will be accessing different services. So I think in terms of intervention development, we also need to think about which are the interventions um, for which people and in which settings. And that kind of brings us on to the next steps, which is my last slide. So we're going to be holding some public and stakeholder events in the coming months 
Um, and at those events, we really want to think about priorities for research in alcohol and cognition. So we'd very much like to take um, both the findings of this systematic review and the kind of lack of findings, but also some of the priorities that you have raised today and take them to some events to see whether um, what people believe the priorities are in this area. Um, and if anyone is interested in attending any of those events um, or has anything to add, then please do get in touch with me. Here are my contact details and uh, thank you very much. That is it from me. Uh, Fiona, would you like to start uh, us off, Fiona Wisniewski? Hi there, I'm an A&E consultant with an interest in um, the elderly. I do sessions with the acute frailty team in my trust, but I'm also the NHS England national, uh, national lead for frailty. Um, and I've been the college, um, at my Arkem College um, rep for alcohol in the past. So this is this is massive. Um, and I was involved um, years ago in the SIPs and the SIPs junior trials. I don't know whether you remember those. They were very A&E driven. It was about um, driving screening, but then intervention as well. And certainly the SIPs junior um, came up with some really interesting results that we shouldn't be scared to ask, you know, um, very young people about uh, their drinking habits. So mm. this, to me, it seems really timely. We've just launched um, a frail strategy around recognising frailty in, in um, over 65 year olds. Um, and the reason we use that age is because of a particular screening tool was that was validated for identifying frailty. We're looking at that with dementia patients um, and obviously not forgetting mental health as well um, and people with delirium. But actually, the forgotten thing here is always alcohol. Um, and, it, you know, it needs a lot of drive around education of our junior doctors and of our clinicians, our frailty teams. So there's a real sort of need or actually just really the screening um, as well as then the interventions. And I'm very lucky in Ealing because I've got an alcohol team that's very established. So they're there working in A&E and they can pick people up. So that's just my first thought would be, could, could something be done around, you know, to emulate the SIPS trial, but in the older adults? And then... Well, I guess, um, so Philippa, I think that's probably, where are you going next with this? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, um, I am familiar with the SIPS trial. I work with Tom Phillips up in Hull, who was involved with that trial. Um, I think, yeah, definitely the next steps would be around developing an intervention and testing it. What we want to do with our stakeholder and public inv involvement events is really think about which areas to prioritise. So um, in my role as research fellow and trial manager, I'm working with alcohol care teams. We're doing an evaluation of that. So hospital settings is definitely a setting that we're considering, Fiona. Um, but we hope to, but there are obviously other settings that might be a priority. So we'll be really interested to hear what everyone says about which area people think they should prioritise. I think, can I just say one more point? The other yes. worry, of course, is that you have frailty services that are commissioned for over 65 year olds. You obviously have alcohol services that, you know, are commissioned for ev ev every age group, well, are usually over 18s. Um, and and then they don't marry up. So if I have a, you know, a 53 year old like that, or a 63 year old I had a few few days ago, who's a drinker and clearly frail and lots of comorbidities, she completely slips through the net and you can't get sort of social care. You can't get the alcohol teams because they won't go to the patient's house, just as one of your papers, you know, highlighted. Yeah. She can't get out and get the help that she actually needs. And then there it's the revolving door back to the hospital. And it's really sad to see those those cases, those individual cases. I yeah, think absolutely. Have to drop Philip a, an email. I think you guys have, have much more to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> that you're very definitely. kindred spirits. <laughs> um, I'm just going to move on to Sarah, who's been patiently waiting with her hand up. Uh, yeah. Sarah Calthani, please. Hey, thanks very much, Philippa. Um, I'm just, you know, as you're aware, uh, systematic reviews have their limitations. <laughs> um, although they're seen as, as gold standards in terms of, of sort of assessment of trials, they also exclude a lot of what we do know from other forms of, of research. And I'm wondering whether, uh, a couple of questions really related to that, whether you had 
considered or, or might consider conducting a systematic map of what is known in this area. Um, yeah. And and then the other part of it is that we, we do know um, from some smaller studies that there are, are attempts to look at um, the utility of sort of cognitive assessment tools with older drinkers that have happened within alcohol services and vice versa. So there, there yeah. is information there that maybe is the step before you're looking at, the step before the intervention. But it's just looking to see what tools we've got and whether they would need for assessment before the intervention um, to see. So is there sort of some mileage in, you know, also taking that step back and seeing sort of what those tools are first before sort of trying to, to move to the next step? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Thank you. I think I hadn't thought of a systematic map, but I have written that down um, because, yeah, I think we you're quite right. Of course, there are limitations to a systematic review and we did try and keep it open, but we were looking for kind of empirical research. But actually, you know, we know that there are some guidelines out there and I looked at the guidelines, but they didn't have kind of papers in them. But actually, there's still stuff to learn from the guidelines because they're developed in consensus. So I think looking at all of those things. And also, yeah, there were papers that were looking at screening for cognition in people accessing tre alcohol treatment, which didn't meet our inclusion criteria. But I think if we looked at it as a kind of map across all of the papers that are relevant to that area, there's probably some cross learning to be had, maybe. Yeah, I think so. I think for me, it's just joining up the dots, isn't there? Because pre, pre intervention, you have to screen. And yeah, it feels to me like a systematic map would be able to sort of start the, you know, putting, putting together the pieces of the jigsaw and what we do know, even if it's small scale, that could then be potentially rolled out to, you know, sort of a big scale study. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Bauer Air. It's Saskia, my first name. That's my surname. Oh, Saskia, come, come join us. What's your question for Philippa? Well, I just want to quickly pick back up on what Fiona was saying earlier as well. Um, I work for the NHS in Leicester um, and I am the team leader here for the substance use team uh, for mental health services in patients. But I also work for Turning Point Community Services. So I'm in an ideal position. I cover both. So in patients and the community, um, my concern is that we screen all new admissions to the wards for any kind of substances, including alcohol. Um, what we often find is that older people fall through the gap because people are starting to struggle uh, with their memory because of long term alcohol use and they don't fit anywhere. They don't fit under our MSOP services. And then, you know, if they don't have capacity, that makes it really difficult um, to provide any kind of treatment interventions within the community and even on, on wards. So it kind of, there is no service for those people. It's really, really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like you might be someone who'd be interested in our stakeholder um, engagement events. But yeah, we know that this is a problem and definitely talking to the alcohol care teams that we're involved with, um, with the proactive study, you know, even if you screen people for cognitive impairments, for example, coming through, looking at the other side, if there's nowhere to send people, it can be very kind of frustrating. So I think that's definitely another research priority um, in this area. Yeah. Well, I think we're mapping out your entire career between. You. I know. It's, uh, have I got enough years to fit <laughs> it all in? Look at the amazing you know? collaborators and ideas that are coming through here. It's just really wonderful. Um, Colin and McAllister, you're next, my dear. Have you got a question for our Philippa? I hope so. Um, it's, so it, there, there's one very brief thing I'll say at the end. Uh, hello, my name's Colin. I work in the public health team in Southampton City Council, uh, and we have what we think is a fairly innovative. Um, uh, brief inter extended brief intervention telephone line. So we offer extended brief interventions for people with increasing uh, and slightly higher uh, level alcohol use. I think just listening to to your presentation, I think the very 
set up of it as a telephone based service is, is probably getting in the way uh, of engaging with people with cognitive decline um it, it's a general population intervention but i'm i'm starting to wonder about popula uh, about pathways and and how we might be able to adapt that and and the assessment process so you've given me a lot of food for thought there however Oh, and if you ever want to do any kind of evaluation of it, uh, we can't afford to do it uh, locally, so you can come and evaluate our telephone line. Works really well. Um, but what I'm aware from our brilliant alcohol care team that work out of the University Hospital Southampton is that the uh, people from non-white ethnicities are even less likely to be identified with an alcohol concern uh, or or even be asked. And so I'm it is is maybe going even further down the uh, a kind of a niche road, but I I'm just aware that that's a population that we struggle to uh, identify and engage with as well. So I'm just saying that out loud in case that's that's helpful. Uh, but thanks, Thank it's really brilliant, brilliant work. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. That's really interesting. I I um was actually thinking about yeah um kind of diverse populations within it, and I do think you know any intervention development should be for everybody so I think that's really good to raise it because it's about just making sure that um, either something will fit all populations or that things are developed in a way that it can um, meet the needs of different populations and delivered to those groups um, and just the other thing I was going to say is yes in fact one of the groups we we're thinking of engaging for the stakeholder events is kind of public health colleagues who are doing kind of brief interventions for holding stuff so thank you I've got your name now <laughs> Brilliant. And Angela, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm not Angela, actually. Angela's sat next to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jilla Rookman, Chief Exec of the Social Interest Group. Um, we provide a treatment resistant, alcohol treatment resistant residential service based in Bermondsey. And um, we mm -hmm. take referrals from across the UK for frail elderly people with cognitive um, brain injury, etc., caused by alcohol consumption ranging from people who may have been in the care home whose alcohol has risen to the point the care home can't take them anymore to somebody who may have been cuckooed in their own house and all sorts of the range. Um, interesting, I agree, Colin, very good observation. We've been running this service since 1990s. Uh, it was based on the Managed Alcohol Treatment Programme Pathway, which uh, a new service in Glasgow has just woke up. Uh, opened up um, and in all the years that we've run it the demographics are completely and utterly white very very few people of color there very very few people who have not had um, uh, interactions with many organizations before they're often not known and come to us via social services and also a and &E departments I don't know if there's anybody from West Sussex here, but I've been part for the past year, hi, for the past year, um, research being carried out with a group of voluntary agencies and West Sussex NHS Trust and created uh, a screening assessment tool, which is now being used by some of the, some of the trust in West Sussex and also the supported housing pathways where a lot of people who have their treat their alcohol use has got to the stage where their cognitive behavior has now ceased, where their behaviors are very challenging and where their memory loss is significant. Um, I'm probably um, safe to say we're at the stage where we need more people to be using that screening tool to get a real picture. But our question after that was what do you do next when you've identified a lot of people who are out there, as your, your research has suggested, who are really in need of support. Um, so we're probably ending, we're, we're operating at the higher end, where people's drinking has got to the point where the memory is really very, very poor to non-existent. Just to yeah. explain that we are one of very few in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't aware of your service. So thanks very much for um, telling us about it. And hopefully I've got your name on our list somewhere so I can get back in touch. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting. And I had heard about some of the work in West Sussex, but I wasn't aware of this screening tool. So I'd be really interested to see what you're using. Thank you. 
Um, could I also call on um, Siri, uh, if you wouldn't mind asking your question? Sorry, I completely forgot you put it in the chat about two hours ago. So, so sorry. <laughs> No, no, all good. Um, well done, Philippa. Um, first bit, it's just a little comment. It was just really nice to see the commitments to open science. You made you mentioned with your calculation that you've put that on open science framework and obviously registering the review on Prospero as well. So really nice to see that. So just a little comment first off. Um, I'm really interested in your findings about computer interventions because I think they're really counterintuitive because you would just, I don't know, I would kind of normally just assume older people not going to get on so well with computers a lot of the time. So I thought those, I mean, you explained it really well, but I wondered, are you take, planning to take that forward and explore digital interventions in your future work? Or is that a bit more of a side finding? I'd love to hear more about it if you had any more reflections. Well, um, the first thing to say is that those studies, and I apologise if I didn't say this as I was hastening through, those two studies were looking at um, eight people aged 18 plus. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we had to kind of extend our criteria slightly. So anything that was looking, and basically anything that was looking at alcohol and cognition, we uh, included it. Um, so it's not certain that that would be kind of translatable into an older adult population with cognitive decline. So this was more a um, kind of working age adult population with cognitive impairments that were linked to drug and alcohol use. Um, but I still think it's kind of interesting, the kind of theory behind it. It kind of does make sense if people are able to do things at their own time. And I don't know at the present moment if I'm planning to do anything with it. Um, but yeah, I thought it was interesting. And one of them was looking at, so the, one of the, the Shulman paper, they did, they kind of, the rationale for them doing it is that in a different kind of population, so you're looking at opiate users with cognitive impairments, people with cognitive impairments did better than people without cognitive impairments with that type of intervention. So, you know, I don't think we can read like loads into it for an older adult population with cognitive decline, but it's definitely something to think about. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. I suppose. Yeah, it says not to just rely on what assumptions you'd have in the background. Or <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Simone. Sorry, trying to unmute. Uh, so just a quick one regarding, obviously they mentioned West Sussex. So I'm the new worker for the West Sussex. So I'm working with Stone Pillow under West Sussex City Council as an ARBG specialist. Uh, yeah. So we're mainly concentrating, myself and my colleague are concentrating on homeless and alcohol. Um, so we're trying to see people when they've got cognitive decline before they get to the ARBD stage, if possible. But if not, I'm also doing the six sit test to test for ARBD and then refer them to the GPs and say, look, I've done this test. And actually, you know, there's strong signs of ARBD. So can we mm -hmm. get them into memory clinics, et cetera? So, yeah, West Sussex are on the ball at the moment and trying to do more and more for the alcohol and cognitive decline. Fantastic. Thank you. That's really interesting. So is your, if you were just, this is a slight aside, but I'm just going to go with it since you're here. Is yeah. your, um, if you identify people as having potentially having ARBD, it, you then go back to the GP. Is there like a clear pathway for your service users? So or? then we have a letter, that a standard letter that we send to the GP uh, with the results of the test that we've done. And then I'll say, you know, can you look into this and refer them to memory clinic? And I'll be constantly chasing. I'm also working with people that are not ARBD yet, but their drinking suggests that they will be, um, you know, if they continue the way they're going. So it's, you know, to try and actively encourage them to get involved with agencies like CGL and alcohol reduction plans, et cetera. Great. Thank you very much. I may be in touch with you again. That was yes, really I've put my email in the um, chat for you. Great. Thanks. Lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, this is brilliant. It's, it's like it's a kind of full networking event as well. <laughs> 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 Everyone's sharing their insights. Simon, do you have a question for Philippa? Um, for Philippa, um, sorry, sorry, not, not directly. Um, if that's a if that's a if that's a problem, please, I'll put my hand down. Uh, I was just going to continue on from what Simone um, said, um, what we're rather talking about, um, which was 
uh, sort of proactively trying to identify people who are either in the early stages of ARBD or potent, or even better, slight, you know, potentially about to develop ARBD and trying to refer them to a memory service, getting them diagnosed in the community setting rather than waiting for them to turn up in A&E or in acute inpatient care where there's obviously a much steeper hill to climb to get them back to uh, to, to health. Um, I'm, I, my role is uh, I'm, I'm a health sort of information specialist. I, I, I write uh, information for, uh, for Alzheimer's Society. And although we don't actually actively support ARBD because it's not a progressive dementia, we do, um, we do provide information on it and we try and signpost as much as we possibly can, which is obviously challenging, as you all know, to services that might be able to help. Um, I'm really interested in whether or not Simone has actually had much joy with West Sussex memory service because last thing I heard it closed down over the winter um it was taking on absolutely no new patients so I mean uh, yeah um, I've I've I'm also I've also I'm also aware of like memory services that just explicitly don't handle ARBD or possible ARBD because they're com they're explicitly not commissioned to handle that 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 type of uh that type of condition so if not a memory service then what are what what where are people being referred to, or are they just ending up sort of in a vacuum? These are the, these are kind of real world questions that are really hard to understand yeah. if somebody doesn't work within the NHS. And I'm sure even those of you who do work within the NHS probably don't know very much either. But if anyone actually knows anything about where these community based ARBD cases end up, I would really love to know about it. Um, thank you for that, Simon. If anybody has any insights for Simon, please feel free to pop them in the chat or or send them through to thank him privately. Philippa, do I'll you want to come in there with that? Um, just to say that I had exactly the same thought, Simon, certainly where I used to work in the NHS. Um, certainly they didn't accept people with any suspected ARBD in memory services. Um, just to say that I we are planning a project where we're going to do some mapping of where people go after presenting in hospitals with cognitive problems and alcohol just uh so we're very interested in that question as well so any question any answers we'd be interested to <laughs> and i also think we're doing a fairly decent mapping exercise as sarah has um as identified yes. in the chat so philippa when you download that later there'll be a lot of fun things for a lot of connections maybe there that you can make for your stakeholder group as well um absolutely thank you oh right hi yeah yes no sorry my name is Lindsay Hadley and I'm the dementia lead for the whole of Sussex so I just thought I'd could give a little bit of enlightenment I believe the um tool that was um used to identify was the audit tool because that was used within general practice and it was felt to be um, useful uh, to roll out because people were familiar with it. So to go back to our previous speaker and then just to answer um, the, 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 the person who's just spoken, sorry, I haven't got all the names up here. Um, the memory services have indeed been shut down um, in West Sussex, uh, they will be opening again at the beginning of April. Uh, but it, Sussex is made up of three areas. So there's Brighton and Hove and East and West Sussex. And both Brighton and Hove and East Sussex have independent memory services, um, which are run by GP federations, basically. And both of those services do accept people who are actively drinking. And I just thought if anybody's interested, what you have got in a way is a nice sort of controlled um, e experiment in that you've got um, Sussex, which has got a very high proportion of elderly people, highest in England. Um, and we, we've had, had a, a sort of look at how many we think might have problem drinking as well by looking at general practice um, and looking at memory problems, people who've got a code for memory problems and people who've got a code for... Um, alcohol um, codes, you know, for alcohol problem drinking and other codes like that. Um, and I, I think it would be good to see whether if we developed some sort of intervention, I mean, that, that is the problem that we are identifying it in the two services that do accept people with drinking um, issues. Uh, but then we don't have an intervention Particularly, um, we refer to STAR or whoever's doing the local 
services, um, but we don't have a pathway. So if, I think it would be a, um, a good area to, to, to try and look at sort of comparisons, really. That, that was all. And we, we would be the East Sussex memory service that um, uh, would, would be very keen, I think, to, to pilot anything, as would the Brighton and Hove one. So oh, thank you so much. What a kind offer. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just going to say thank you so much. That's really interesting. And I'd be very interested in the data that you've got as well. I was actually considering going to the Sussex integrated data set to try and do some prevalence data in this area. So it sounds like you may have already done that. So uh, thank you well, so much. Yes, we just did it, uh, you, you know, very finger in the air, but just looking at yeah. two or three really representative large practices, you know, and you yeah. can get a pretty good idea then because that's all coded quite accurately. Um, the okay. SID... The SID probably would, would that's the Sussex integrated data set. Um, it, it, I, it would be interesting. I don't know how much those codes, but we could set up a search on that, but you'd, that takes quite a while. So, you know, you know, lots of people have to agree to do the search and things like that. But it, yeah, I, I mean, it would be a good resource to certainly um, use for that purpose, but even just looking well, at individual practices. I'm just conscious of time. Uh, and I just want to say an enormous thank you to Philippa. If we can all use a little clappy thing, or you can clap <laughs> if you put your camera on. <laughs> you. You're technologically incapable of doing that kind of stuff like I am. <laughs> <laughs> Philippa, that was a wonderful tour de force. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next with all this wonderful collaboration and discussion we've had. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Philippa. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending. And I'm really looking forward to getting the chat and doing a bit of mapping just from what we've got in there. So thank you.